Well, thank you all for filling this room rather more than I expected it to be. I hope I uh, don't disappoint you. <coughs> uh, my name's Stephen. I'm going to talk about some monitoring. And we're going to cover a lot of topics in a very short amount of time, um, hence the A to Z. Although I don't think I'd better fill every letter in the alphabet, but I'll try my best. Um, so I'm primarily a software developer. I've done these things in the past. I've worked quite a lot with databases. And I've done some embedded, some networking, a bit of everything. Um, but more recently, I got the chance to play with some very expensive toys, um, aka infrastructure, um, actually building uh, what I guess you would call private clouds for uh, companies with very high performance computing requirements. Um, and this led me into monitoring. Um, because these systems, there's a lot to go wrong. There's a lot of very complicated software. So you really need to make sure that it's all working. So this talk's mostly going to be about the infrastructure we use for monitoring. But I'm going to touch a bit on how you can integrate some of this into software as well towards the end, if that's more uh, your interest. So monitoring, what is it? Visibility into things, hardware, software, websites, clusters, databases, making sure things are working the way they should be. More importantly, it's the pretty graphs, though. And I think you'll all agree with me there. Um, managers like them. Draw some graphs, get a pay rise. Everyone's happy. Uh, but some real reasons. So we want to find faults, and we want to be alerted when things go wrong, when disks need fixing, when power goes out. We want to look back and work out why something went wrong and how, what we can do to prevent it in the future. We can use it for auditing, whether that's security reasons, making sure that only the people we want on our systems are actually using them, or for billing, AKA in the cloud world, where you have to pay money for things. Um, we can use it to analyze how well we're using our hardware. So we might have bought a load of hardware, or we might have paid a lot of money to a cloud provider. We want to know, are we using all of it? And are we using it efficiently? Now we can use it for performance monitoring, profiling. Uh, we, can, we want to find bottlenecks in our system and work out where we can make things faster. And we can use it to do some planning as well. So if our system's this big, how many users are we going to have in a year? How many servers do we need to buy? That sort of thing. So as I said, we're going to cover a lot of topics. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about each specific one. Um, this is meant to be a good overview of monitoring. Um, there's just not enough time to go into everything. But if you are particularly interested, uh, then last year at NDC, I gave a talk about uh, time series specifically. Um, and we're also not going to look at any specific pieces of software. I'm not going to name any software. If you um, put the appropriate term into your favorite search engine, you'll find lists upon lists of software you can use. Uh, but again, too much to cover, too short time. If you're using a cloud, then maybe look at what they offer. It's a good starting point. So, we're going to talk a little bit about alerts, logs, tracing, metrics, and at the end, a bit of instrumentation. Two of these topics are going to take most of the time of the talk, and that's going to be logs and metrics. So, alerts. Um, alerts are essentially an automated checking service. You have some service that is constantly checking whether all your things are working by periodically running these checks. And it's going to alert you when things go wrong. If something does fail, then the intention is that we notify some sort of human. The human will drink coffee. And the human will fix, hopefully, what is broken. So these could be external checks. So we ping a server, try and get a HTTP endpoint, something like that. Um, we can check specific things about software, like is a process running? Is a process using too much memory? Or we can be looking at hardware. So are the temperatures of our hardware too high? Is something going to overheat? What disks have failed and need replacing? Are there any network ports that might indicate faulty network cables? Something like that. And notify someone. I don't know if anyone still uses pages, but you know, mobile phones, email, instant messaging, 
and we can display all of these things that are broken in a nice fancy dashboard. So I kind of consider this the foundation to what we're going to talk about. You know, a lot of the justification to spend time doing this is to make sure that things keep working. You know, if you have to go to your boss and say, why do we need to put time into this, then it's going to be, you know, for this reason, it's going to be alerting and making sure that you get told about things that are broken. Um, but if something does go down, you know, what actually broke and how do we actually fix it? So for this, you probably will look at some logs. And that's what logs are for. So logs, probably don't have to go into too much depth about this. They're text, human readable, usually, and they're ubiquitous. You probably wrote software that does some logging, which isn't going to be new to you. Um, useful logs, however, are less ubiquitous, but they should help resolve issues. You know, they should contain errors, they should contain useful information so that you can trace back some complaint from a user to what actually went wrong in the system. And you can use logs to create alerts from, but I find they're often more useful when something has gone wrong and you're working out how to fix it. So where can we get some logs from? Well, the operating system, whichever that happens to be, will produce many logs for you. Uh, your stack or your middleware, your databases, they'll all give you logs about what you're doing with them. Um, your applications and third-party applications, very importantly. These logs contain a wealth of information to work out why it's not working. Um, and even hardware. So if you've got network switches and routers, they'll even give you quite useful information as well. Basically everything. You know, everything that has something to do with computing will give you logs. It's pretty much guaranteed. Unfortunately, there's not really much consistency between all of these logs that you're getting out. In fact, it's a complete mess. Um, there's very little consistency between what your software might produce and what your kernel might produce. However, there are some column, common elements. Um, log entries usually contain a timestamp of when the log, when the event occurred. It might give you the originator of the log, so the host name, and that could be a VM or container or physical host. Um, you might get the name of the application that produced it, if it was an application, and you might get some sort of severity, like is this an error, is this just a warning, something like that. And then the actual message. And this is probably the worst of all, because there's absolutely nothing to be, uh, no consistency to be found here. Um, it should contain uh, some sort of meaning about what went wrong, and maybe some context-specific data, like usernames or IP addresses, but let's look at an example. So this is a typical application log you might get from some back-end server. Um, it might write the logs to a file or to the operating system, um, and you get some generic preamble, so like we just talked about the timestamp and the originator, and hopefully some sort of description about what went wrong additional data. So for this error message, we're being told that we can't write to a file, and the reason we can't write to it is because the disk is full, and it was this connection, you know, imagine there's some sort of user session somewhere doing this to our service, it's this connection that experienced the fault. So this is quite a good error message, it's quite useful, it tells you exactly what you need to do, and hopefully you can trace it back to the user or the client that caused it. So we've got a few categories of logs. Errors are probably the most useful. Um, if some request failed, the log ideally should contain the root cause of the problem. Uh, we sometimes get lower severity errors as well, such as warnings, which might mean that something did break, but we were able to recover from it. So it's not a big deal. Um, the other thing we often get is events. So something interesting happened, it's not a problem, but it might be useful for debugging in the future. And state changes. So the software or the hardware is going to act differently going forward. Maybe it's going to write to a different database, use a different disk drive, something like that. Something that could be important when working out what's gone wrong. 
There's also tracing, and we're going to talk about this in more detail later on. So, uh, log aggregation. So, if you have one log file, you might, if you have one node to log on to and one log file to grep through, then, you know, that's pretty straightforward. You can do that. It doesn't take too much time. Um, the problem comes is when you have two nodes to log on to and check the log files, or if you have four nodes to log on to, and you have to go to each one of those nodes and check each one of those files, or if you've got eight nodes to log on to, you see where I'm going? Yeah, once you get to tens or hundreds, this really becomes impractical. You can't log on to 100 different containers and see, what the, see if there's an error in the bottom of the log file. Um, so what we do instead is we take all of our logs and send them somewhere else over the network and put them in some central place, some central server, um, either in a single file, file per host, whatever. The idea being that we log on to one place, we can check through the end of all the log files really quickly, see what went wrong. Uh, we do keep the local logs often as a buffer on the originating nodes and in the services. Um, so just in case our central log repository goes down, we can still go and look at the nodes individually if we absolutely have to. And we can handle very small kind of bursts in traffic. So uh, we can search all of our logs from a single host. This is a good thing. Um, the logs are still available even if the node crashes, which is quite useful, or if you've got some bad actor and they've gone and deleted your log files, well, if you've offloaded them, then they're still available to you. And we can actually store quite a good amount of history without having to add disk space to the individual node. We can make a very heavy central server, fill it full of disks, and we can store week, months, years of logs if we have to. If you're storing years of logs, that might be a bit odd. But. So this, doesn't, this isn't completely free. There is some complication along with this. Now, every node must be configured to log to the central place. Um, and you've introduced a bottleneck into your infrastructure. So all of your logs are going to this one place. And as you add more servers, or um, as applications get noisier, then you're going to have to think about scaling this. Um, and also, it doesn't actually help one of our original problems in that we still have a mess of all these log formats. It's just now we've all put them in one place. Um, so this is how we get on to talking about uh, log parsing. So if we have our application log that we looked at earlier, what we'd like to do is we'd like to give this some structure, um, JSON, whatever you like. Um, and you typically configure this kind of log parsing software with regular expressions, um, although you don't have to. Well, it just happens to be how a lot of the software works. Um, and what we want to aim for is some consistent structure, so all of our logs are in one format, and we can search and analyze them in a consistent way. Uh, so this parsing is usually broken into two steps. We usually look at the preamble separately from the message. And the log parsing system often does the preamble for us. It just happens to be how the logs are transported around that this data is already nicely separated. Um, so if we look at an example of this, we can see that the timestamp can be pulled out, uh, the program and the severity into a, and we start building up this JSON representation of our log instead. And for the time being, we just put the whole message in there. What we now have to sort out is what we do with the message. And this is where we start writing these regular expressions, typically, but not always. And not only do we want to pull this message apart, but we want to capture bits of it. And we want to tag this message with some sort of identifier so it's easy to find later on, so we don't have to keep searching for this potentially quite long string. So our regular expression might look a bit like this. Um, so we match the first bit of our message 
Then we pull out the uh, path of the file that caused the problem. Uh, we could pull out the connection, so the IP address and the port number. And crucially, we could pull out the error message as well. So if we look at how this might work, and then we also tag it with some sort of tag. So if we look at this, what we essentially do is when we matched this particular log, we add our tag on, and this replaces the message for all intents and purposes. We can pull out the path, add that as a field. We pull out the IP import, and we can pull out the error message as well. So there's our full conversion. So this is great, because what it can do is we can give all of those logs coming from all these places a consistent format. This means that this data that we've built up is going to be a lot easier to index and a lot easier to search, either by writing little scripts and bits of code ourselves or by putting it in a database. Unfortunately, it isn't completely free. Again, nothing's free. We have to actually go and write these rules for all of our software and all of our hardware. And hopefully, by this point in time, there exists a good repository of these rules already out there in the world. Um, especially for very common things like Apache log files, Nginx log files. Um, you know, these are going to exist for you. So this takes us on to the topic of structured logging. So let's look at an example of not structured logging to start with. So this is Python, but you can imagine it however you please. It's fairly generic. Um, we have some logging API that we call in our software. And we have some format string defines what message is going to come out. And we have some variables which we want to intersperse into the message. So we put the path name in there. We put the IP address, the port number. And then we might put a stringified version of our exception in there as our error message. And this might come out a bit like this, just like we were looking at a minute ago. The preamble in this case might be produced by the log server you're sending to, or it might be produced by the library you're using. But normally, you don't have to do that yourself, unless you're writing a logging library. Um, but I think there's enough of those in the world, so maybe don't write your own logging library. And then we've interspersed all of our variables into the message there. So um, we could parse this now, like we're parsing all of our other logs. But this would be a colossal waste of time. Um, because if we just looked at the code and we had all the fields that we put into our login, nice separate variables, so why don't we just output the structured format directly? We'll skip the formatting step and we'll skip the parsing step. Um, so we looked at the Python example, but if we look at other programming languages in C sharp, maybe you'll write something like this. You know, the syntax is a bit different, but Still the same process. Even in C, if you're using syslog, um, it looks remarkably similar. Um, so, but we'll look at the Python one just as an example. But it's going to be very similar no matter what language you're using. So this is what we did before. But we want to output all these fields in a structured form instead of a textual form. So the logging library will do a bit of this for us. You can probably configure it so that it outputs JSON, and it at least outputs that metadata as JSON. And like before, I'm sure you could get it so it outputs the message just as a field in there. Structured logging APIs tend to vary this ever so slightly, and it really is quite ever so slightly. Um, by instead of having some huge message, we just give the log or the event some sort of name that's easy to index and look up later on. And then those variables, which we formatted into our message, into a textual form, well, let's not do any of that. Let's just output them in the structured form that they were in the application in the first place. Seems almost too simple, is not it? So this is great because it gets all of our important variables out of our application without having to do all this parsing in our logging infrastructure. Saves a lot of effort. Um, 
And crucially, we don't have to go and update our infrastructure every time we add a new log message to our application. So that's really good. And it removes this round tripping. We're not formatting and then reparsing again. And there's some marginal efficiency as well, perhaps, if you're in a language where that sort of thing matters. Um, however, the big but is that you have to be able to change the code that's actually producing the logs. You can't just go onto your uh, favorite network appliance and start telling it to output logs as JSON. Maybe some you can. Um, and for best results, you really need to make sure this structure has some consistency to it. You know, if some of your logs are using username and some are using user, or some are using IP versus IP address, is this is actually going to still cause you quite a lot of problems if you're looking for everything that happened for a particular IP address, or if you're looking for everything that happened for a particular user. So the worst case is we still need to actually do some processing and some parsing to fix this. So that's not great. Um, so let's have a little talk about databases. So we've got this lovely structured data. We now want to make as best use of it as we possibly can. And text files are great. They're really easy to use. Open them up in a text editor, search for something. Brilliant. The problem is searching them is not very efficient. It's not very robust either. So let's say we wanted to find all the logs for a particular time range. Well, that's going to involve some fairly complicated regular expression, or maybe you have to write a bit of uh, Python or some sort of script to do that. What if you want to find all of the logs for a particular program, or if you wanted to find all the errors? Well, you essentially end up going through your log file to find these two things. It's a file, so you have to walk through the entire file, everything that's in that file from start to finish, to find what you're interested in. And this is fine if you've got a couple of hundred megabytes of logs. It's not fine if you've got a couple of hundred gigabytes of logs, which you may balk at. But um, if you're heavily invested in the cloud and you're adding servers on demand, then you could easily end up with a huge amount of log data. So the database will typically give us some sort of index, which will make it easier to find entries in a particular log store. This is a gross oversimplification, but as I said earlier, I really don't have enough time to go into the details uh, of this. Um, but the idea being that the searching becomes more efficient if we've got our logs in the database, because we can build indexes on particular fields that we're interested in. Um, some databases that have advertised themselves for storing log files. Um, also have text search abilities. So if you have human readable uh, text in the database, then you can do some searching on that. Look for particular phrases in your logs, things like that. And we can also do some more advanced analysis. So what databases are good at typically is finding data and producing reports about your data. So we could. For example, build a report for all the active administrators last month. You know, typical reporting stuff. Um, however, databases aren't simple. And if you're thinking of spinning up a database um, to support your existing software, then your infrastructure can quite easily become as complicated as the software you're monitoring. So um, think a little bit about you go down this road. I mean, take, a, take into account there are a lot of advantages, but it will cost you a bit of time as well. So uh, one last topic to touch on about logs, um, queuing. So log traffic is generally bursty. It's usually low, and then when an error happens, this error cascades through the system. Errors cause other errors, and you end up with this kind of burst of log happening all at one go. And the worst thing is, it's when you really need the logs because something's gone wrong. And we're also increasing the overheads in our infrastructure because we've put in this central bottleneck by sending all the logs to one place. 
We've put in these parsing and processing steps, and we've decided to put it all in a database, which can be relatively slow. And not only that, but we have to deal with increasing volume, more, service, more services, things like this. So we want to retain this ability to put all this data in one place because we want to keep the data burden off of the nodes and off the producers because we still want to be able to have the logs there if we get a crash or a breach. So we make a trade-off. We say we can deal with a bit of a delay between the logs being produced and the logs being queryable and fully processed. And for that reason, we can pop a queue in between, which consumes or takes all of the logs and just persists them without doing any processing on them very efficiently. And typically, depending on the software you're using, this can be scaled up and the software will spread the data out over a number of nodes. But anyone notice that this is the exact same message I put up a minute ago? So queues aren't very easy either. I don't know if anyone's ever had to maintain a RabbitMQ cluster. Um, it's hard work. They're just as complicated as databases um, because they are databases. That's another talk. So again, go into it with some APRA. With a, don't go into it without thinking about it first and whether you actually need it. So changing topics completely now. Uh, tracing. Uh, well, not completely. So tracing, tracing can mean a lot of things. It's typically a form of logging usually some sort of debug logging. You're using it to debug your application. It can reuse all the logging infrastructure you've put in place. And there's also bespoke tools for visualizing traces and collecting them. The data is usually consumed by developers. It's not often intended for your users. And the way I like to think of it as is we're thinking about whole operations. We're not just thinking about individual events happening. So we're trying to give some more meaning to our logs, make them a bit more useful. So you can think about a trace in two ways. I like to think of it as a pair of events, an operation starting and an operation finishing. And we could tag the log in the same way with some metadata as we did before in our structured logging. And we just have two events, start and stop. Alternatively, we could think of it as a single event which represents the completion and the start is implicit by the fact we're representing a completion. We add, therefore, a timestamp in to say when the operation as a whole started. And there's, there's trade-offs between these two. Um, but fundamentally, they're the same. They're representing the same thing. So there are all sorts of things we can trace. Network connections, uh, I.O., user sessions, database transactions. Um, one of these categories is non-intrusive. So we can get this information out of the process, out of our program, without actually changing it in any way. So we can use hooks in our compiler. We can use hooks in the operating system to tell us when file I.O. is going on. Um, and we can do intrusive tracing. So we can actually add things to our software to explicitly say, we're interested in this operation here to here. And some of your middleware you're using and some of your libraries might actually do this for you. And if you're using third-party software, which you are because there's an operating system underneath you and there's probably a database, then they're going to produce traces as well. So what's the most interesting thing about tracing? Why is there a whole section on this? Well, I consider the most interesting thing to be relationships. Um, because when we have an event, it's really just something that happened in isolation. There's no context. What we're doing with tracing is we're starting to give some extra context. So simplest one is the start end. We kind of touched on that earlier. If we have two events then we can relate them together with some identifier. 
UUIDs are quite common for this purpose. And we can use it to build a link between the start and the end event. And therefore, we have a representation of an operation. And having this explicit, rather than just relying on the timestamps of when the events happen, is very useful when you have the same operation which can happen in parallel. So you have overlapping operations. So parent-child relationships. You can think of a child operation as like one function calling another, one operation needing to invoke another operation for some reason. And again, you could infer this from the timing, because you can see that we have this sort of outer operation, and we have this inner operation. And we know that the inner one occurs in the time span. But it, it's not very robust. It's a bit brittle. We're sort of making guesses. And then if you've got overlapping operations, it's going to become hard. So we want to explicitly link these together with some identifier. So we can say, this operation was caused because of this other operation. And we start building up this hierarchy of operations. Um, a cause, consequence, or a follows, as it's sometimes called, is very similar to a parent-child. Um, you can kind of think of it as an operation that was caused by an operation, but the originating operation doesn't actually depend on the operation. So it doesn't need the result. It's just something that happened because of something else. There's a subtle difference, but sometimes it's quite useful to make it explicit. So why are these relationships useful? Well, profiling is probably the most obvious one, because if you, when you start building up these traces, they start to look a lot like a call graph. If you've ever used like a profiler in your um, uh, tool chain, your compiler tool chain, um, we can start looking at the duration of operations. Uh, computing worst case durations, average durations, and we can start finding bottlenecks in our system. Which bits of an operation are actually taking longer than others? What should we look into? And of course, we can use them for troubleshooting. Extremely useful for finding the root cause of an error, because if you have a user request that failed, then you can trace that, as the name implies, to the sub operations, and eventually you might get down to the fact that a database transaction failed because a disk was full. And you'll be able to relate those all the way up through your application. This is especially useful in distributed systems where part of your application is running somewhere else, because these relationships can propagate node boundaries. This is extremely useful. So let's look at a bit of a visualization. Um, Quite a nice visualization of these traces. Some people use graphs. That's an option. But the timelines are quite nice. So we can, if we've got two user requests, then we can kind of plot them like this on a timeline to see when something is going on. And then we can, if we've got sub-operations, we can add these as well. And as I said before, we can propagate these IDs even if bits of this Software are actually different microservices, or running on different nodes. And with that, we can actually still link them together. So we can see that our user request called into our authentication service, and then it did something with the cache. And again, you can extend this as far down as you like. Um, if you get to the database level, then um, you might even be able to use some tracing that's in your uh, database client library, or you could parse the log files from your database. And assuming you've got some that identifier in your request somewhere, maybe you can do something. So you can start building up these really nice visualizations of what's going on. So these relatively simple relationships provide a huge amount of information. And you can even reuse all that existing logging infrastructure you put in place. Unfortunately, the volume of data can become vast, uh, especially if you're quite liberal with where you put all these tracing operations in your program. Um, there's lots of techniques to deal with this. Uh, so for example, sampling, so only capturing some of the requests. Um, a lot of tracing systems, for example, uh, like Chromium or Linux kernel, they have their own trace file formats, which are optimized to store the data. 
Um, and we can also start doing aggregations of some of our traces. So if really all we're interested in is the average duration of something, or the number of times a request happened, or the number of times a database write happened, um, then we can just compute those and emit those instead. And this brings us nicely onto the topic of metrics. So again, like logs, metrics can come from all over the place. We can measure uh, disk space, we can measure CPU usage, we can measure the number of requests, we can measure the latency of particular operations in our application. Uh, we can get metrics out of hardware appliances. Um, and we can actually measure physical, real-world things as well, like temperature or power usage, for example. Um, if you're on a cloud, you might also want to measure cost. So you could put the amount of money you're spending. So the goal here is to build historical data. We can easily log on to a node and see how much disk is left. But what we want to do for the sake of troubleshooting is we want to see how the CPU usage varied over the last hour. So we can build these trends um, over time. And by this, we really start to get an insight into how our application is working or even how a third party application is working. Yeah. And again, we can create these visualizations and graphs of um, things going up over time, things going down over time. So, what sort of metrics can we get? And how do we get them? So the typical way we obtain metrics is by polling. So every few seconds, we might poll something like CPU usage. And we could write this to a log file, but it's more useful if we put it in a database. And for the same reasons as we put all the logs in one place, having all of our metrics for our entire cluster um, is useful. So we can do analysis over every node that we're running. Uh, what you'll actually have when you're doing this is you'll have multiple metrics. You're not just going to have one metric. Um, you're going to have multiple collectors collecting different bits of information from different sources. So we might have uh, three metrics that are coming in every minute, and we need to be able to identify what each of them actually mean. So there's two quite common schemes for doing this. Um, the dotted this kind of dotted notation where you have like host name dot CPU usage. Um, and another notation where it's like you have some tags and you have a name of the metric, um, which some people consider to be better. So that's how our data might look. And we've got two CPU sensors and a temperature sensor. And then we're tagging which host the CPU usage was for. And you end up with this data that kind of looks quite similar to structured logs in a sense, just with an extra value kind of tacked on. That's kind of interesting. So visualization, um, if we've got our data that we looked at a second ago, we might want to pull out the temperature of our rack of servers. Um, and we might want to plot the temperature over time. So we can pull out the three values and draw it on a graph. And you can instantly see, you know, this isn't news to anybody, the graphical representation, you can immediately see that the temperature's going up. Um, where I was looking at the raw values, it's a lot harder. So these visualizations are extremely useful. And we also might want to compare metrics. So let's say we wanted to compare what was happening with two hosts, then we could you know, plot the CPU usage of both on the same graph and compare the two. Uh, so all this data, what we're actually looking for when we're doing these visualizations is we're looking for a particular time window in a potentially bigger set of data. So for all the same reasons as a database was useful for storing logs, makes them very useful for storing metrics as well. So. Time series databases are a category of databases that are very useful for uh, storing metrics. Um, and there's been a surge in development of these things since the big data and internet of things and whatever the next one is. I'm sure there'll be a machine learning time series database in the next couple of months. Um, you know, these, there's 
so many of these things, it's incredible. I do have a list. I mean, it's, it doesn't fit on a slide. Um, but they're great, they're really useful for storing this kind of timestamp versus value kind of data. And they're fairly straightforward. We just take our data from these metric collectors at this regular time interval, and we put them in the database. And we can query the data points for a particular metric, like our CPU usage, for a particular time window, like the last five minutes, the last hour, or maybe we're interested in the day last week because we're troubleshoot troubleshooting some issue. So these databases have some very useful characteristics, which are worth uh, touching on. Uh, they were very good at compressing data because time series data tends to be very repetitive. There's lots of repeated values. And the time points are very regular. So this bodes very well uh, for compression. The, a database will offer you the ability to define a, a rolling window of data. So the database will very efficiently delete data that's older than six months old or a month old, which is something that's not very efficient to do in even in SQL or NoSQL databases. And they also have this really interesting optimization for pre-aggregating your data. And this is specifically useful for when you want to visualize data over a very large time window. If you imagine you're collecting a CPU usage every second for a year, that's a lot of data points. Um, so to run a query on all of those could be quite expensive. So they're particularly good at optimizing this. And I'll just go very quickly over this, because as I said, I did actually do a whole talk on this, just this topic uh, last year. Um, as we collect data, we build up this aggregated view of our data points. So when we get, let's say we're combining every two minutes of data into one data point, then we build up these sums and mins and maxes and counts as we go, as we ingest data. So we end up with a representation of our data that's a fraction of the size of the original data, just at a lower resolution. So if you imagine you build up, uh, if you imagine this is halving the size of the data, then you can also build up a view that makes a tenth of the size. Um, and this is much faster to query, and this is how these time series databases are able to give you a view of your metric over an entire year extremely quickly, because they've pulled all this data down and pre-aggregated it into these time buckets for you. So this is extremely useful to be aware of because some of these databases will need some manual tweaking. So you need to tell them kind of which metrics you're interested in um, and how you want them aggregated. So we go right back to the start when we were talking about alerting. We have this uh, alerting monitoring service, checking all of our stuff. But it's actually duplicating a lot of effort that we've just put in. Because we're collecting all these metrics now, and this monitoring service is also going around, checking disk spaces, checking temperatures, and so on. Um, and this can put a bit of an unnecessary load on our system. Some metrics can be quite expensive to obtain, uh, especially if you're talking to hardware appliances, like if you're talking to network appliances over SNMP be very slow to maintain statistics from those. Um, so really, what we want to do is we want to use our, the metrics that we've already obtained and use them instead of reacquiring them. So we can use the values from our metrics database instead and introduce some sort of simpler, more lightweight alerting service that simply takes the data from the database and applies the checks to them. And this is all very software dependent. It will depend a lot on what time series database you happen to use, whether it has alerting built in, whether there's some external service, whether there's some external service, but it's specific to a particular database. Yeah. So trivial example of this, if we have some disk usage metric, we might be able to create an alerting rule for when 
the disk usage exceeds 90%, say. And the syntax for this will depend heavily on uh, what software you choose. And you might get some sort of useful, nicely structured output where you get told the timestamp of when the alert fired, um, the name of the alert that fired, and uh, the value, and which entity. If you've got multiple CPU usages or multiple disk usages, then it will tell you which host, for example, went over the threshold. Uh, and yeah, plenty of dashboards and notification mechanisms for these as well. Um, but this is actually a very powerful concept because we have this opportunity to create much more intelligent alerts because we have much more information. We've essentially decoupled what metrics we're collecting from how we're checking them. And our original all-in-one kind of monitoring service, it was doing both of these things at the same time. It would check a disk, and then it would, it would, sorry, it would get the disk usage, and then it would check the disk usage hadn't exceeded a threshold. What we've done now is we've taken those two operations and pulled them apart. So what we can actually do is we can do a few things. Uh, we can start building aggregates. So we could actually say, is the total disk usage over all the nodes in our cluster over a certain threshold? And we can get our uh, metrics data, and we can sum all that data up. We can start looking at recent history. So we could make a much more intelligent alert for, say, a CPU usage metric. We could say, did the CPU usage over the last five minutes exceed 99%? You know, can we check for pegged CPUs? Um, and we can actually use history even further back. So we can do some very simple trend analysis, and we can say, well, what's the usual value for that uh, CPU? What's the usual value for that, the memory usage of that process? And then we can then see if the memory usage, for some reason, spikes uncontrollably outside the normal average. So lots of good reasons for doing this. But the nice thing about this is it actually uh, simplifies your infrastructure as well, because you've taken that checking and that alerting and monitoring service and turned it into something much simpler. So that's good. So based on kind of what we just saw, the advantage and the advantages of that, sometimes taking metrics from log files is a good idea. So producing very simple counters over time. So we can count the number of errors, for example, or the number of info messages. Yeah. Because we can then correlate this with all of our other metrics that we've built up in the system. And you can, there are log processing tools that will do this for you. Um, or you could even do it at your application if you liked. So, simple example of this, you know, got a couple of logs, we have two errors, so the count's two. Not really very complicated, but quite an it's a more interesting concept when you think about what that data can be used for alongside your other metrics. That's when it starts to become a lot more interesting. Um, so there are a couple of disadvantages to this. I mean, you're grouping all this data together into essentially time buckets. So you're losing a lot of precision about the original events. Um, and storing all that data is redundant because your log database probably has some facility for counting logs. Um, but you could actually avoid actually having a log database entirely if all you're using it for is for visualizations, alerting, and analytics if that's all you're using it for. If you still find it useful for looking for particular events, then you, you're still going to want to have it. Yeah. But it can save you a lot of effort. Um, the other thing this is really good for is improving the query performance of these uh, kind of queries that span large time ranges. If you start computing counts of logs that match particular criteria over large time windows, it's going to put a lot of strain on many databases that are more designed for finding pieces of data 
than for uh, creating, than for analyzing them. Yeah. What we've done here by producing these metrics is essentially pre-computed the values, and therefore it's much more efficient to draw these summaries. Um, yeah. So if you're doing this, be a bit cautious, because log entries are very rich. There's lots of unique identifiers in them, and this can easily overwhelm your time series database as they're designed more for a limited number of series, but lots of data points. Um, create metrics for only things you know you're going to query very common. So like things that are for, foremost on your troubleshooting dashboards. Create metrics for those, but you know, don't go overboard. So we've just about got a bit of time to talk about uh, instrumentation. Uh, so there's lots of information you can get without changing anything in your software. Huge amount of information. And we talked a little bit about all of this. REST endpoints, pinging servers, uh, metrics from the operating system, from middleware, um, and injecting tracing into your compiler or your VM runtime, whatever that happens to be. Um, instrumentation is about modifying your code and exposing internal information that's in your software and whether that's through logging or tracing or through metrics. And there's plenty of libraries for these uh, purposes in whatever language you happen to be using. Um, there's no real general answer as to what you should expose. You're going to have to just use some intuition as to what's interesting for your domain. If the most interesting entity in your software is a user, then maybe you want to get some information about users, like number of users, how often users are hitting a particular service, things like this. Um, but it's going to need some experimentation and probably some um, a few cycles to work out what's really interesting. So just for an example, imagine this is pseudocode. Um, have some user, code, user lookup function. Checks if the data is in a cache. If it's not, it reads it from a database. And imagine this code is misbehaving in some way. You know, the, the data for the wrong user is being returned. Pretty serious issue. Um, or imagine the code is slow. Slow. How do we even start debugging that? How do we identify which part of the code is slow? Where's the bottleneck? Well, we can add some logging. Um, we could log all these requests. And we could also log when the cache is used, and maybe we can use that to determine, well, is the issue only on a particular path? Is it only when the cache is used? Is it only when the database is used? So that's quite useful. We could use some tracing as well, which kind of achieves the same thing and might look a bit like this. So around your database transaction, you could trace, and you would know, therefore, when the transaction started and when it ended. And you can work out from there. Um, we could also introduce some metrics. And what we might want to do is instead of logging every time we read some data from the cache, maybe we just count the number of times the cache is used instead through some sort of metrics interface. Um, and this is, this is an interesting trade-off. When should you count something and when should you log something? Uh, as a rule of thumb, anything that's very high frequency or anything that's particularly performance sensitive, you might see benefit from counting rather than logging every single individual event that happens. So for example, the idea of using a cache is to improve the performance of this function. The last thing we want to do is go and add an expensive overhead to it. So maybe just counting the cache hits so using counters on your fast paths and using more detailed logging on your slower paths, um, that could be a good rule to follow. Uh, you could also look at using metrics for exposing small pieces of state. So for example, it might be useful to track the size of your cache or some in-memory data structure. And you could do that in various ways, depending. Um, on the library you're using. Uh, or you could maybe monitor some uh, state from your database. A particularly useful one I've 
experienced in the past is to just simply log uh, which database you're actually using. So if you've got a database and it's actually a pool of multiple databases, then just simply logging which one your software thinks it's talking to is surprisingly useful. Um, so there's some ideas for you there. So to summarize, uh, what should we consider when we're thinking about monitoring? Well, my advice for anything I ever talk about is keep it simple. So don't assume you need everything that I've discussed here. There might also be more I haven't discussed which you need. Um, but think about what you're actually trying to achieve. What are your goals? Are you just interested in some basic health checking? Do you, need, do you want detailed performance profiling? You know, what do you actually want to achieve? What are your requirements? Think of it as you're designing an application or a piece of infrastructure. You know, think about what it needs to do. Start with the fundamentals. And by this, what I consider the fundamentals to be, you probably need some sort of alerting. You want to know when things are broken or when things might break. Um, aggregating your log files is always useful. And collecting system metrics is always useful. Consider adding some software instrumentation as well. I really think the most valuable insights come from instrumentation you've explicitly added. You can get a lot of information from your environment, but you, know, you have to put the work in to get better results. So you should also think about where your software is going to run. Is it running internally? In which case, you've probably got a lot of flexibility in how you monitor it and how you debug it. If you're running it on some cloud provider, then you'll find they provide all of these tools. They'll provide endpoints to send logs to and metrics to and tracing data to. I mean, you'll be paying for it. So bear that in mind. Um, if you're running on a customer data center, then do they have their own monitoring? It's very possible you might have to integrate with their monitoring system. Do they have no monitoring at all? Well, you might have to be prepared to provide some monitoring for them. Um, and how can you actually get that data out so that when they phone you up, and your software is not working, how do you troubleshoot it? How do you make sure that it works next time around? Um, so that finishes my talk. Unfortunately, I'm on the uh, hour mark. I've got two minutes left. <laughs> so if anyone's got any questions, um, it's probably easier if you just come and talk to me afterwards. Um, then we don't have to rush. So. Uh, thanks for your time.